Wait, how does this work? You just press the button. This one? No, not that one. <laughs> You're listening to Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to all things nuclear. I'm joined now by Tom Kalina, Director of Policy. Joe Cerincioni, President of the Plowshares Fund. Philip Yoon, the Executive Director of the Plowshares Fund. Development Director from Plowshares Fund, Elizabeth Warner. And here's your host, Joe Cerincioni. Thank you, Dell. We're going to start off with our review of the news, and there's a lot, lot of it. And then we've got a terrific interview with Eric Schlosser, my friend, uh, a noted authority in the field, a board member of Plowshares, and the author of the award-winning Command and Control. But first... We are doing our first giveaway. I used to love this when I was in the radio stations I would listen to as a kid would do giveaways, and we're going to do one too. We are giving away two free tickets to the first five podcast listeners who email us at events at plowshares.org. These tickets are valued at $250 each, and it's to our gala event, our annual event that's June 10th at the San Francisco Jazz Center. Eric is going to be one of the featured speakers there, as is Beatrice Finn, the, one of the leaders of ICANN, who you heard on last week's podcast. But there's more. We're going to have um, Deputy National Security Advisor Ben Rhodes, former Deputy National Security Advisor Ben Rhodes and nuclear historian Alex Wellerstein, a part of the Chain Reaction Group, that are going to engage us all in truly compelling conversation. This is a fundraiser for us, but we're not asking you to contribute anything. Just send us an email to events at plowshares.org, that's spelled P-L-O-U-G-H, the English way, and you will be, if you're one of the first five, you will be the recipient of two $250 tickets to Chain Reaction. Send us an email, mention you heard about the offer on Press the Button. It's as simple as that. Thanks. And now, early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. warning. A seven-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. We're sitting in the glass-enclosed nerve center of Washington, D.C.'s headquarters for Plowshares Fund. It's a beautiful day. You can see the Washington Monument, the Ben and Jerry clouds in the background. It's just, it's just gorgeous. And I'm here with our deputy policy director, uh, Mary Kaczynski, and our program director, Michelle Dover. And I got to start by thanking you, Michelle, for filling in for me for two weeks while I was out of town. Oh, thank you. It was a blast. <laughs> <laughs> so to speak, <laughs> you, you did, you did a wonderful job. You really added a lot of energy and enthusiasm to the whole thing. And I loved uh, the, the all-female cast and the "Let's Go, Ladies." I mean, that, that is how we do business around here. <laughs> that was just great. Well, we've got a, a lot of news to cover in a very short time. We try to do this in the amount of time the president of the United United States would have to respond, to decide whether he or she was going to press the button upon notification that there was a nuclear attack underway. That time is approximately five to seven minutes. That's what we give for the news. The clock is ticking. Let's get started. Michelle, what are you covering? So last week at the Hudson Institute, the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, Lieutenant General Robert Ashley, Jr. said that the U.S. believes that Russia is probably not adhering to the nuclear testing moratorium um, consistent with its obligations. He then softened this to say that Russia has the capability to conduct such tests. Um, And in a later panel, Tim Morrison, a senior director for the National Security Council, said Russia had probably already violated it. So we heard a series of statements um, saying that Russia has either violated or probably violated this test ban treaty with no evidence. And the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization, which monitors these tests, also said that it did not see any evidence of this. And um, upon further investigation, this, you know, we realize this does not reflect a convince, consensus view of the intelligence community. He backed down from the charge. Didn't he say later to reporters that there was that Russia had the capability of doing these tests, but didn't actually do anything yet? It's correct that he said that, um, but then there was also just some chatter to reporters later from unnamed senior officials with conflicting uh, information. Now, tests of any kind, of any yield, are prohibited by the Comprehensive 
test ban treaty passed in uh, 96. I was actually involved in the campaign to encourage that, that treaty to be negotiated and signed. The, the, the U.S. signed it, but the Senate never ratified it. Correct. So is this part of an effort to get the U.S. to back out of that treaty, to, as, as the Heritage Foundation has, has advocated, to unsign the treaty, so pull it off the Senate agenda? Uh, likely. It's also, I think, a part of, part of a broader narrative, right, that mm. Russia is an unreliable partner in arms control agreements. And, you know, this is something that Congress should continue to ask questions on, particularly as we have modernization plans for our nuclear arsenal in front of Congress that could in the future lead to calls for resumed testing if we have new weapons. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Meanwhile, Mary, there is big news breaking on Iran. It's in the front page of the papers on Monday morning. Tell us about it. So Secretary of State Pompeo announced over the weekend that the U.S. is prepared to talk with Iran without preconditions. This appears to be something of a reversal from mm -hmm. the demands that Pompeo outlined last year. He laid out 12 demands on Iran that basically amount to complete capitulation. Practically nailed them to the cathedral door. <laughs> exactly. Well, it was completely unrealistic, a list of demands. Everyone expects that uh, talks between the U.S. and Iran are very unlikely to happen despite this announcement, and that's because everyone involved wants very different things. Iran wants sanctions relief. They want the benefits that they were promised under the nuclear deal. The Trump administration has imposed all of the sanctions, a total oil embargo on Iran, and they seem unlikely to let up on that. Well, it's been my view, and I think yours, that th that there's factions in the administration that are contending. Is is is, is Pompeo's faction sort of losing out? Is he acceding to Trump's position, which is basically he doesn't want a war with Iran? He said so the last week. Exactly. At least in public, there does seem to be a lot of daylight between what Trump wants and what Bolton and Pompeo want. Yes. So Trump has made it very clear that he doesn't want war with Iran. However, Bolton very much does. He's consistently advocated for military action against Iran. He's called for, for regime change very consistently. Bolton appears dead set on a military confrontation with Iran. So is there any prospect that Iran and the U.S. could actually talk now, maybe in September, when uh, Rouhani comes to the UN, what do you think? Sure, never say never. There's always a chance, but I think you know the prospect of talks is very unlikely. Again, they want completely different things. The U.S. wants Iran to behave like a normal country, whatever that means. Iran wants a lot of sanctions relief. You know, the kind of things that can't be reversed the next day if Trump changes his mind again. So, if talks happen, it would probably be something very small. You know. Not unhelpful, so talks about prisoner exchanges, for example, but big for big talks, a complete reversal of the policies, no. Right, so that would be a sign. If the U.S. is serious, they would start small, try to get some kind of agreement on something. But I, I agree with you. The prospects that we're going to get a breakthrough here are slim. And meanwhile, the pressure builds up, and it looks like the plan is to put so much pressure on Iran that the Iranians do something foolish, and they're perfectly capable of doing that, that would provoke a military conflict that could be a Gulf of Tonkin type justification for war. Exactly. Well, at the end of the day, actions speak louder than words. And despite what Trump and Pompeo have said, the mm. actions that Bolton are taking are making war more likely. They're deploying more troops to the region, provoking Iran into taking steps that could be a pretext for war. Michelle, thanks. We've got other things to cover. So on Sunday, the ac acting Secretary of Defense, Patrick Shanahan, um, spoke to reporters saying that he did not see a need to restart the large scale joint military exercises between the U.S. and South Korea. So if you'll remember, these are the exercises that typically happen in spring. They were suspended last year as a part of the ongoing diplomatic negotiations with North Korea. Um, and there have been questions ever since of whether this is something that we should restart for the need of military readiness. And you know, having your acting Secretary of Defense say that this is something that they are going to still say suspended, stay suspended, and this is not needed, mm. I think is a sign of, you know, where they're hoping things are going to go. Yes, trying to keep things calm. And it's nice to hear from our military leaders that these exercises are important, but they're not essential, that you can maintain military readiness with reduced exercises, uh, uh, contrary to what some pundits here in Washington have to say. Mary. Well, another huge story, uh, a scandal that's still developing, is that the U.S. State Department funded a group called yes. Iran Disinfo, 
allegedly to counter information that's put out by the Iranian regime. However, this group, Iran Disinfo, has been attacking U.S. citizens, Iranian Americans, here in the U.S. again with U.S. taxpayer dollars. These groups that are pro-diplomacy, groups that are working on calculating the cost of U.S. sanctions on Iranian citizens, groups that are doing really good work here in the U.S. Again, American citizens funded by U.S. taxpayer dollars, these attacks have tried to silence those voices. Right, a coordinated smear campaign funded not just by big donors who back some of these right-wing groups, but by the State Department now. American taxpayer dollars going to attack U.S. citizens who are pro-diplomacy and pro-human rights. We're going to have more in this next week, but we're almost out of time. Michelle. One, one more story that will be certainly touching on next week is this week the House Armed Services Committee will be marking up the military authorization bill. So stay tuned to see what stays in as the Democrats mark it up for the first time since taking control. Let's see what their nuclear policy looks like, or at least what they would like it to look like. But we are out of time. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you very much, Mary. It's been a pleasure. I'm in the glass enclosed headquarters of Plowshares Fund DC with my friend and board member, uh, Eric Schlosser. Some of you know him from his, his book, uh, Fast Food Nation, made into a film, Food Inc. Uh, I know him from Command and Control, which I consider the second best book ever written on nuclear weapons, right behind Richard Rhodes' uh, making of the atomic bomb. Uh, Eric was nominated for the 2014 Pulitzer Prize for that book. He's also a filmmaker. He's produced several documentaries, uh, one based off of Command and Control, which aired as a, a, a PBS special, The American Experience. So thank you very much for taking the time to join us here in our offices today, Eric. Thanks for having me. And there have been so many books written about nuclear weapons. That's very high praise. It, it is one of the best. It's it's Thank great. You. I recommend it to all my friends. I mean, the, currently I recommend your book and then Dan Ellsberg's mm. uh, a book, but yours is the more scholarly and the more thorough and the more historic. And it's a great read. Uh, you, you just you you can't wait to get to the next chapter to see what's Thank happening. You. So thank you. We try to keep this podcast between 30 and 40 minutes, uh, which is the flight time of an ICBM. So from the time you begin to listen to this podcast to the time it ends, that's about how long it takes a missile to go across the ocean. Uh, hopefully uh, our conversation <laughs> won't be as deadly. Well, yeah. no, it's not. But, we'll, but I want to talk to you about three basic issues. And, yeah. and one is deterrence, the nature and, and morality of deterrence. The other is, is command and control, yeah. the nature and reliability of our command and control system. And, the, and the, the last is going to be about strategies, ab about what, what you see as the prospects for developing a saner nuclear policy. But let's just start with de deterrence. The basic justification for the U.S. nuclear force right now, uh, whether it's true or not, it's, it's the alleged justification, is that we need them to deter others from attacking us. Yeah. Do you believe in, in that justification? Do you believe in the strategy of nuclear deterrence? You know, um, it's complicated because there are some opponents of nuclear weapons who would argue that they never deterred, that the Soviet Union had no intention after the Second World War of invading Western Europe, and that they were so, you know, uh, destroyed by the Nazi invasion that they did not have uh, world domination on their mind. I, I happen to believe that particularly in the early years of the Cold War, America's nuclear weapons were, in fact, the guarantor mm -hmm. of freedom in Western Europe. Uh, the Russians, the Soviets may not have invaded Germany, but certainly their conventional military dominance was uh, extraordinary. The United States has, has, had essentially disarmed after the Second World War, right. not anticipating there would be a Cold War. And the threat to destroy Soviet cities with atomic bombs, I do think, had a real yes. uh, impact in keeping Western Europe free. So deterrence does work. And I could even accept that right now, uh, some of our security is based on deterrence. Mm -hmm. um, there's incredible anti-American feeling in Russia. Something like 60%, 70% of the Russians now talk about having good feelings about Joseph Stalin. Mm -hmm. So it is, a, it is a dangerous world. The problem for me with nuclear deterrence is it works until it doesn't. 
Uh, nuclear deterrence isn't like a lock on your door that cannot be picked. It's not like a, I hate mm -hmm. to use the word wall, let's not even go near a wall, but it's not, <laughs> it's not a physical protection. Yes. It's a psychological protection. So I think, you know, what may have worked for much of the Cold War in a bipolar world when there was just the United States and the Soviet Union and their satellites that they controlled mm -hmm. that had nuclear weapons may in fact no longer be relevant in, a, in an age when there are nine nuclear weapon states. And when you look at the history of the Cold War, even if you accept that deterrence worked, there are a number of instances where we came perilously close yes. to deterrence failing. And uh, well, if, you document these in your book. You, I was rereading a New Yorker article yeah. from 2014 where you you talk about the 1980 incident, yeah. where a failed computer chip, I think it was a 46 cents computer chip, failed, and the United States thought we were under attack. And uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski was woken up in the middle of the night and Zbigniew told to wake up. Brzezinski was woken up in the middle of the night and told that a hundred. Uh, Soviet missiles were on their way to the United States by his chief military advisor. And he said, check that and call me back. And uh, he got a call back and said, no, it's actually a thousand. This may be an all out attack on the United States. And he said, thank you. It was his, uh, it was his military attache, General William Odom. And Brzezinski prepared to advise President Carter to launch a massive retaliatory strike. He was aware that submarine-launched Soviet missiles might be hitting Washington, D.C. within minutes. And Brzezinski thought about whether he should wake up his wife yes. and say goodbye to her. And he decided not to wake her up so that she would die in her sleep mm -hmm. in a nuclear blast. The phone rang again, and it was General Odom for the third time saying, sorry, sir, that was a mistake, false alarm. But Brzezinski was prepared on the verge of calling Carter to advise a retaliation. And when I talk about deterrence failing, not just through a technical glitch, but through miscalculation. I mean, at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Joint Chiefs of Staff were unanimously telling President Kennedy to uh, attack the Soviet missile uh, battalions in Cuba. And they were unaware that uh, the Soviets had put tactical weapons on the island that were ready for use and that the local Soviet commanders had the authority to use them. Mm -hmm. And if Kennedy had followed the Joint Chiefs of Staff advice, and at yes. one point Robert McNamara, his Secretary of Defense, was agreeing with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, yes. we would have had an all-out nuclear war because the Soviets would have responded by destroying American carriers and probably the American base at Guantanamo and maybe even in Florida with tactical weapons, short-range weapons we would have responded with an all-out nuclear attack on the Soviet Union. Uh, we would have completely destroyed the Soviet Union. And so deterrence is a very, very dangerous way mm -hmm. to maintain the peace. And, and as I said uh, at an event last night, I think deterrence is a euphemism. It's a word in nuclear strategy that hides what we're really doing. Let me talk to you about that, because you wrote about what we're doing with deterrence. And I want to know if you still agree with this. I, I'll see if I remember. <laughs> yes, <laughs> well, you write a lot. Every technology you wrote embodies the values of the age in which it was created. When the atomic bomb was being developed in the mid 1940s, the destruction of cities and the deliberate targeting of civilians was just another military tactic. Yet nuclear weapons have no other real use. They threaten and endanger non-combatants for the sake of deterrence. Yeah, and that's what deterrence is. Um, even though we have a, a policy in this country of counterforce, which is that we are gonna only aim at military targets, the unusual thing about nuclear weapons are the collateral effects. So you may hit a military base, but you could also kill hundreds of thousands of people who are nearby, either yes. by the blast or by the fire or by the fallout. So when you're talking about nuclear deterrence, again, if you get rid of that word, you could just, I think, more accurately substitute the phrase hostage taking. And the Russians right now are very open about how they're not aiming at military targets, that they're coming up with these new weapons like their undersea drone that is going to detonate off the coast of American cities. And it's only possible. And use. set off a radioactive tsunami that right. would wash the city. Right. So right. And that they only the only use they're talking about is killing civilians. 
So we are right now essentially holding hostage the civilian population of Russia, threatening to kill them if they attack us, and they're doing the same thing to us. And I would like to think that world order can be maintained without threatening to slaughter hundreds of millions, if not billions, of civilians. I mean, it's 2019. It's not 1419, because this sort of hostage taking was commonplace in the medieval era. It was very commonplace also uh, in the Roman era. And in 2019, why are we in Russia uh, threatening to kill one another's civilian populations? And, and that's essentially what deterrence is. And do you question this because you, you question its effectiveness uh, for the reasons you just stated, or do you question its morality? Both, hmm. both. Um, if deterrence fails, billions of people will die. And that must make you question the policy. Yeah. Uh, and nuclear weapons, as that, that passage noted, um, are really only effective for killing civilians in large number. I mean, every other target can be destroyed, particularly in the age of precision weaponry, uh, can be destroyed without causing that same sort of right. civilian harm. Right, and these are the only weapons, the only military strategy we have where the failure or of it or the execution of it results in such destruction. We, we've engaged in unnecessary and terribly destructive land wars and that, that have cost us trillions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of lives, but nothing like what a nuclear miscalculation would mean. Which brings me to my next topic, yeah. command and control. And obviously, you've, you're, you're now one of the leading authorities in the world on this, having studied it and written it. How long did it take you to do that book? Too long. <laughs> I thought it was going to be a short book that I would very quickly write and get back to my other work. And um, it took six years. Six years. And you've and, been writing and talking about it since, yeah, still. I I've learned a lot more since it came out. And one of the things you've been talking about recently is the intersection between cybersecurity and command and control. Yeah. What are you worried about there? I'm enormously worried. I mean, when we're talking about the modernization of the arsenal, mm -hmm. most of the debate is going on about the three legs of the triad. Do we need them? How many of them do we need, et cetera, et cetera? What should the cost be? Estimates are you know, over a trillion, trillion and a half, maybe even two trillion if the cost overruns occur. But to me, the most important part of the whole system is the nuclear command and control system. And that is uh, the communication network, the early warning satellites that have to accurately tell you if you're under attack or you're mm -hmm. not attack, the ability to give a launch order, uh, the ability to make sure that something isn't launched or used without proper authorization. It's the least glamorous part. It's the least discussed part, but in many ways, it's the most important part because you could have brand new submarines, brand new missiles, brand new bombers. And um, if you don't have a command and control system that works, they're all irrelevant. Right. So let's say we reduce the accident rate down to a very small percentage. It's still that risk. The new concern is that not something accidentally goes wrong or a computer chip fails, but that a third party hacks into the system. Right now, the nuclear command and control system that we have was designed in the 1960s and 70s and implemented in the early 1980s. So we have computer networks, we have communication systems, we have communication satellites and early warning satellites that represent you know, the technology and the thinking of 30, 35 years ago. Are they vulnerable to cyber attack? Nobody knows. That's the quick, that's the simple answer. I hope that they're not. Uh, when 50 Minuteman missile went offline at F.E. Warren Air Force Base for an hour, mm -hmm. there was concern that someone had hacked into the system to demobilize those missiles. And they were so concerned that they sent maintenance crews to each one of those 50 silos to visually inspect that the missiles were still there. Yes because they couldn't trust the cameras. Were they being spoofed? Had someone just fed in footage of a missile in a silo when in actuality the missile had left the silo? One of the reasons that things are so critical right now is that this system has to be upgraded 
and it's in the process. Right now, we're in the process of thinking how to upgrade it. The estimated cost for the command and control upgrade are about $100 billion. It's got to be done correctly, but it's also, in some ways, one of the most dangerous moments is when you're transitioning from the old system mm -hmm. to the new system. And it's not like if Amazon has a you know a problem as they're adopting a new software and the Amazon store goes offline for six hours. The nuclear command and control system has to work perfectly 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And this is an area of, of real concern for me because you know, the old war games notion of a teenage kid in his living room mm -hmm. hacking into the nuclear command and control system and starting World War III, that might be overblown. I mean, it's worth mentioning that when the Pentagon saw the film War Games, yes. it had an impact on their studying even more uh, the vulnerability of their system. But, you know, with foreign powers and the incredible, you know, technological abilities of China, Russia, uh, even North Korea in this sphere, uh, there's also an element of the insider threat. Um, Snowden was a relatively low-level private contractor at the NSA who was able to get into the most top-secret programs of the most top-secret mm -hmm. intelligence agency. And there's no evidence he did, but the NSA is responsible for our launch codes. And there's no evidence he got anywhere near that. But there's the insider threat in our command and control system. So you add up the risks of uh, the use of nuclear weapons by miscalculation, by accident, by madness, or perhaps now by cyber hack. Yeah. And these, to you, and I think to, to me and to many Americans, total up to a set of unacceptable risks. Yes. That you know, maybe there is a, a role of, of, in deterrence, there's a role where nuclear weapons uh, actually keep us safe, but the risks are so enormous that it's not worth right. the insurance policy. So your solution to this is abolition is get rid of the nuclear weapons, not yeah. simply reduction. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. I'm a supporter of the abolition of nuclear weapons, uh, as is the United States government. Uh, through its signing, Our official policy. We signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. It'll be almost 50 years next year. It'll be, I mean, it's the 50 year yeah. anniversary next year. We are committed to the abolition of nuclear weapons. It's an idea that every president since Truman has embraced. Does that mean I support unilateral American disarmament tomorrow afternoon at right. three? No, that would be a very dangerous policy. But we have to have a goal, and that end game is eliminating mm. these machines that were built and designed for mass murder that we can never perfectly control. So the fewer of these machines there are, and the more tightly they're controlled, and the more tightly the rules regarding their use are controlled, the safer that we are. It is miraculous that no city has been destroyed by a nuclear weapon mm -hmm. since August of 1945. And there's absolutely no guarantee that the great good fortune that we have had so far will last. And so, you know, I'm a great believer that the United States and Russia, who possess more than 90% of all the nuclear weapons in the world, need to sit down and seriously discuss how to reduce the size sizes of their arsenals and that no other country should be allowed to get nuclear weapons. So we're seeing now a new interest in this, yeah. a, a new momentum towards reforming our nuclear policy, in part because the existing nuclear strategy has proven to be so dangerous, in part because Donald Trump has demonstrated the instability of a system that can be controlled by one man. And, and that individual's decision of whether to launch or, or not. And so you're, you're seeing this, uh, but there's no, because there's interest doesn't mean there's going to be success. How do you think we'd best position ourselves over the next couple of years? I mean, starting right now to try to change U.S. nuclear policy and restore uh, some sanity to the, the way we configure these and posture these weapons. You know, the thing that I care most about, and it may just be because of my background as a writer and filmmaker and being involved in, in creating these cultural artifacts, is the first step for me is creating public awareness. Hmm. 
there is so little knowledge about the current nuclear threat. And, you know, my generation, I was at university in the 1980s, everybody knew about this. Everybody thought about it and cared about it. And it was that knowledge and awareness that led to the change. Yes. That led to the end of the Cold War peacefully and led to these huge reductions in the sizes of the arsenal. So anything we can do to increase the awareness? Anything like that we can do to create a movement in the United States to greatly reduce the risk of nuclear war and one day eliminate it. So the, the, chain, the action chain there is that public awareness leads to political pressure, leads to political action. When, um, when we made the documentary Food Inc., um, which was about the harms of indu the industrial food system. It had a, mm -hmm. it had you know implicit policy recommendations. We showed it uh, to some high level members of the uh, Obama administration privately, and the message that we got back was, "Make us do it." Uh huh. Uh huh. And this notion that the president of the United States or the Congress is somehow going to lead the way on any of these important issues is completely mistaken. And the politicians at the local, at the state, and the federal level will respond to popular opinion. And it's easier to think that we can just pass a bill that will solve all of this. But the bill needs the overwhelming support of the American people and the passion of the American people behind it. Mm -hmm. It's much harder to create a movement in some ways, but I think that's what needs to be done. And once there is that awareness, once there is that passion, about literally saving the world from annihilation, um, I think the odds of it actually happen. Our time is almost up. Yeah. We, but I, I want to ask you about your overall view. Your overall, are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? Yeah. Which way do you see the trends going? You know, to be optimistic is to believe that everything will turn out okay. <laughs> and I'm not. But I'm hopeful. I'm uh, really hopeful. Uh, my background academically is history. I don't think anything is inevitable in terms of you know historical events. And if things aren't inevitable, then things don't have to be the way they are. The, the number of nuclear weapons in the world has gone down from a peak of maybe 60, 65,000 yes. down to 14,000. Yeah. Uh, that's a very encouraging trend. And right, people said, forget that. They, this is where the, the arrows have been pointing down. Fewer weapons, fewer countries to trying to get these weapons. The control systems that Republicans and Democrats enacted over the last 30, 40, 50 years have actually worked and, until now. And no city has been destroyed yes. in 74 years. And that's yes. a remarkable achievement. And but now we've flatlined. Now there are no reductions. There are no talks about reductions. Uh, the, t Trump has broken the Iran deal. He's failed to make a deal with North Korea. So we're at sort of a, an inflection and, point. And, and I guess the question I want to leave listeners with is you, you look mm. at Latin America, where none of the countries have nuclear weapons. You look at Africa, where none of the countries have nuclear weapons. And neighbors don't necessarily love one another. And there's still strife and there's still violence. But there's not the threat of mass murder on the scale that would make World War II seem insignificant. I mean, mm -hmm. 60 million people were killed in World War II over the course of six years. A nuclear war could kill hundreds of millions, if not billions of people in a day or two. Yes. So we've got to figure out a way to coexist with Russia and coexist with China and for India and Pakistan to coexist with one another, not have to love one another not have to agree with one another, but not have a belief that their security is dependent on threatening to kill the men, women, and children of their adversary by the tens or hundreds of millions. Mm. Well, thank you, Eric. Thanks for thanks spending for time. Me. And, and thanks for, for all, all the work that you do in this field. It, hey, Joe, yes. back at you. <laughs> I mean, you have decades of committing your life to this. Well, it's great to be and, in this together and it's with tough, you. Um, it's tough to see the beginnings of a new nuclear arms race. And it's something that has to be fought mm. against tooth and nail. But I come back to the positive aspect, which is the movement has been successful thus far yes. at preventing a nuclear war and preventing a nuclear catastrophe. And that's a real achievement. Thank you, Eric. And now, 
a special announcement about an upcoming Plowshares Fund event. Hi, I'm Bonnie Fisk, Senior Development Officer at Plowshares Fund, and I'm here to tell you about an exciting event we have coming up on Monday, June 10th in San Francisco. The event, Chain Reaction 2019, will highlight a new moment we see now to reshape the national debate on nuclear strategy. We are thrilled to have Beatrice Finn as our keynote speaker. She's the executive director of ICANN, the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons that won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. Other speakers include former Deputy National Security Advisor Ben Rhodes, author Eric Schlosser, and nuclear historian Alex Wellerstein. Tickets are on sale now at plowshares.org. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced by Delphine Vigil and Megan McCall. Sound design by Derek Zender. Audio engineering by Derek Zender and Will Lowry. Research by Alex Spire. Theme music is by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.